<clears throat> Sorry, I'm not as enthusiastic this morning as I usually am. Hey guys, Peacemaker here, friendly neighborhood metalhead. Had some impending doom there. Whee! <clears throat> Good band, awesome band. Yeah, let me let me take this guy off. <laughs> It's gonna make me real hot if I don't. Oh, wee! Handy though, right? Gotta wear our masks. That's what they tell us. Even though it's crap, because <laughs> I was telling them before that you know, hey, one extra barrier doesn't doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt. You know, may not help, but it doesn't hurt. And uh, and they're giving me crap about it. <laughs> So anyway, guys, this is another installment of the Bible Basics. This is going to be one of my more in-depth... There we go. The goofy. <laughs> there we go. Um, Bible Basics. This is going to be one of my more content-packed episodes. we got a lot to get through, so I'm just going to go as fast as pretty much I can. <laughs> and let's pull, let's pull up my screen here. In just a sec. All right, so yeah, a couple of announcements first. Um, one is I'm going to be editing these videos nowadays. I think so. It may or may not um, end up helping with a lot of things, right? But less rabbit trailing, um, more uh, content. There we are. As you can see, this is where I'm at up here, video editing. Um, so we'll probably do some more of that. So if you see chops, like like breaks in the video or any of that in my next videos, that's why. It's because I'm cutting out all the ums. I'm cutting out all the unnecessary rabbit trailing or some of that stuff because you guys have asked for it as well. So thanks for the feedback. Um, I do recognize that people have time constraints. My best friend's a night stalker at King's, so he can't <laughs> can't watch an hour long video all the time, you know. Well he probably could, but point being though is it's easier if it's shorter for them. Also they have the attention span of rabbits. Love you guys. <laughs> Just kidding. Um so yeah, time constraints. I totally get it. I totally get it. And I'm gonna try to cut uh, the videos shorter. Um but here's my ability and concerns. Producing great content. I need some help. Um, if you guys want great content, I have to spend more time on it. If you guys want great lessons, I have to spend more time preparing. I mean, look at all these notes, right? This took me like two hours yesterday. When I go back to work, I'm not going to have that time. So my concern is that I'm not going to have any ability to scale back work if I need to or I don't, I want I'm this ministry to bless you guys. I do. And to do that well is different than to just do it. So I'm going to also put out some merch. This, this isn't up there, but um, I'm going to put out some merch. I'm going to get some, uh, some shirts and some, probably some mugs maybe or something going just so there's other ways that you guys can support me and get the word out. So look for that. It's coming down the pipeline. Um, thank you to all you who do support me. I appreciate it. Um, even with shares and, and comments and whatnot, I do appreciate it. Please get the word out, right? Like keep sharing it and, and all over the place. All right. So what we're going to hit today is Genesis 1. Or, uh, excuse me, 2. <laughs> oh, Genesis 2. There we go. Verse 1 to 7. We're going to be concluding that section of text. So, whoop. Let's see here. So, in Genesis 1, we just finished Genesis 1 here. Let me hit the button. So, yeah, we, we did the history of creation already, right? We talked about what it could and what it doesn't mean. Could be, doesn't mean, what it has to mean, what it is like. We've talked all the way up to the sixth day. You see right there where we left off. I hate that feature so much. You 
<laughs> stupid sticky note feature, whatever you are. <laughs> All right, sixth day. See right here. Right there, sixth day. I'll just hold it for a bit, and then we'll do the sticky note thing. So now what we're going to do is we're going to read the last day, which is the seventh day. But this brings up an opportunity for learning in the Bible basics. So chapter one in the English version ends there, right? Day six. Well, obviously, in the original text, the thought wasn't done yet. And we'll pick that up in chapter two. So boop. here we are. Chapter two says, thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day <clears throat> from all of his work, which he had done. Verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which he, God had created and made. So that kind of finishes out the thought, right, from, from, <laughs> from the first chapter. Um, and, and we'll talk about that in a sec. Well, let's keep reading. Let's read it all, and then we'll go back. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. <clears throat> before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before the herb of the field had grown. For the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But the mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. So that's what our text says for today. Now I stopped there because I, well, one thing, a couple things I have. This, this video is not going to be about the text as much as it's going to be about a lesson about background. And important things to know and a couple arguments and things that keep me grounded and should keep you grounded that I kind of missed also in chapter one by the grace of God he reminded me of um, so we have these first seven verses here and uh, let me pull up my notes before I botch the order of how I wanted to do this Zoop. so the first two things we're talking about one is text numbering so as we saw with chapter one the thought wasn't done right at least till verse three i think of chapter two then you have a natural break in the text which would have been hebrew right but in the english it kind of chops it up differently so think of that right so know that i should say so just because it has a heading here in the new king jimmy or any of them or just because it's now chapter two doesn't mean that the thought's done. So always go with the text in, in reading it and all the way to completion of those thoughts and then and then kind of go from there, right? So we don't want you to miss anything, right? And that's because the text numbering and the text headings and all that stuff were added by, excuse me, headings were added by uh, translators. And not only translators, but um, <clears throat> there's even been well, really, translators. <laughs> There's a couple of folks, though, that did the numbering of the text a long, long time ago as well. I didn't pull up their names. It's really irrelevant. But just in case you were wondering, it's not in the Hebrew, right? So that whole flow just flows right through. You just keep reading, right? There's no, there's less referencing. I mean, now they may have <clears throat> since redact or gone back and uh, re added them in, but I don't know either. So, and even then it wouldn't match up with these. So, let me see here what else. Oh, yeah, apparent contradictions. So, <laughs> you'll hear this from a lot of atheist folks. Sorry, I'm still like grooming myself here. Eh, there we go. So, you'll hear this from a lot of atheists that there are contradictions in the Bible. Um, that is not true, as far as I can tell. Nine times out of ten. Oh, and that Hit me! <laughs> I didn't bring my notes over here. But let me go get my notes in just a sec, alright guys? It'll be like a brief stint of me running over there. 
and grabbing something and coming back. Because <laughs> I stupidly forgot to grab that. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and this is probably one of the things that I can just edit right out, right? I'll go ahead and do that, possibly. Um, so you may not even see me do it. But when I was going through the text, we have an apparent contradiction here. I say apparent because it looks like it until you actually dig into it, okay? There's a lot of them that are that way. There's a lot of contradictions in the Bible that after you understand what's being said and why it's being said and what is actually being said in the original languages or you get the right time so timeline, uh, it just dissolves. The, the contradiction is not there. There's no contradiction. It's just two things that are written that mean different things. So in verse 5 is our apparent contradiction of the day. Before any plant of the field of the earth was in the earth excuse me and any <clears throat> uh, any herb of the field had grown for the lord had not caused it to rain on the earth and there's no man to till the ground but the mist went up and watered the whole face of the ground okay so we got plants it says here not being haven't been made yet is how the apparent contradiction goes they'll say the plants haven't been made yet and the lord formed man of the dust of the ground wait i thought that man was formed on like day six or whatever it was, right? Let's talk back over to chapter one really quick. Just have to do it like this. There we go. That would have been smarter to do it like that anyway. So yeah, we have day three, second day, third day. We see grass, herbs, fruit, trees yield after its kind. <clears throat> Whose seed is in itself on the earth. Okay. Day three. So the apparent contradiction goes day six. Or... Yeah, day six. Let's make man in our image. Let him have dominion. Sixth day. So which is it, Christians? Were the plans made on day three and man made on day six? Or was man made before the herbs of the field? I want you to sit there for a second. I'm going to go run and get that. And it'll be a little brief cut for you guys. Probably. We'll see. Ugh, when I edit it. But I'm going to go run and grab my notes because this apparent contradiction needs to be dealt with, yeah? I'll be right back. Apparently happened this time. <laughs> All right. So here we are. <clears throat> as, I, as I told you before, I'm learning Greek and Hebrew. And in the Greek, I think we can absolve we can absolve ourselves of an apparent contradiction pretty easy, like. So <clears throat> in Genesis two five it does say that <clears throat> we we can see that, that these words mean something, we'll say. So in Genesis two five these words mean something. Okay, that's a good rule of thumb. We already established that last a few times ago, I think. That words have to mean something. <laughs> so the first way of understanding this text is right here. Before any plant of the field was in, in the earth. Okay? So just don't gloss over in. Because that's important. And that gets more faithful to the text. Because I looked it up in Greek. Greek says something that seems to say something a little different than what you get from the English here. Okay. Now I'll, I'll substantiate that. And before any herb of the field had grown. Oh, okay. All right. <clears throat> By the way, does it say that before any herb of the field was or was created? 
No, it doesn't, does it? So that's the easiest way out of that apparent contradiction. Like it doesn't say what you're making it say. Silly atheists. And otherwise. For the Lord God, this is the why, right? For. <laughs> why? Well, because the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there's no man to till the ground. Oh, so we're talking about tilling now. Are you starting to see it come together? It's not about whether or not the herbs of the field have been created yet. God had already done his creating work. Day three, he's already done his creating work, right? This is kind of just giving you a brief overview, zooming up to day six here, because the climax is next, right? It says a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. This is the climax of chapter two, in the little passage that we have today. The Lord formed man. Of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Which, by the way, if Jesus hasn't breathed into you yet, you're not a living being. Uh, I want you to know that. Spiritually speaking, you're dead. You need to be brought to life. And that only happens when we're in right relationship with our creator and our maker. Please know that. Please hear that. Um, I don't know who this gets shared to or who's going to hear it. So I just want to throw the gospel in there a couple times. And Jesus died for our sins and rose again so that we can rise again when we die and be with him forever to conquer sin and death. So anyway, guys, <clears throat> in the Greek, I kind of put the sentiments together. <clears throat> There's three different words used for land, um, or ground, or earth, really. Um, so let me let me read it. The general gist of what I kind of got from the Greek that's a possible reading or understanding. Okay, I'm not saying this is the best one or this is how the verbiage goes or how the tenses go. I'm not that good at Greek yet. <clears throat> Just looking at word by word, I came up with basically another way to read this would be and before any green tillage, which would be the word field there, tillage or farms had arisen upon the ground, which would be was in the earth, right? Okay, so this is the idea there, right about there is where you have the idea of and before any green tillage farms basically, had arisen upon the ground. Okay? Keep reading. It says, And before the herb of the field had grown. Before any herb of the field had grown. Okay. It says, generally in the Greek, about and or even before pasture land had arisen. So that, like I said, you kind of get a different vibe, right? Like, oh, before there was gardens, and before, they, you know what I mean? And before there was pasture land, what happened? Because, so in the Greek, we get God, Elohim, Yahweh Elohim even. So it's, it's in the Hebrew, it's the divine title right here, Lord, right? Translated like that, by the way. Anytime you see that in the text, L-O-R-D, capitals, Yahweh. Divine name um, did not send water or moisture upon the ground, being the Greek. God had not caused it to rain on the earth in the he, in the uh, English translation. I got God did not send water or moisture upon the ground. So it's telling you he didn't give rain like he did or like he does today. <laughs> Um, but, so that makes a lot of sense, transitioning right into verse 6. But, a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Um, and also, there was no mankind to work the ground. So I missed this, sorry. And there was no man to till the ground. I got, there's also, also there was no mankind, really. Uh, anthropos, I think was the Greek. Septuagint is what I would be using. Um. 
to work the ground. So you see how that kind of dissolves? Like what it's saying is there is no agriculture, right? Before agriculture, <laughs> you didn't have any agriculture. Or before man, excuse me, before man, you didn't have any agriculture, right? And God dealt with creation as such. Um, but afterwards, he started sending his special rain. He started to bless faith people by creating more and more of a cycle with which we now see the earth operates. It's not to say it never rained, but God had not caused it to rain, right? God didn't, and I think of this as something that's nice for like a child. Just bless you <laughs> with some rain so you have good crops. So that's our text for today, guys. That's done and over with. Now let's get into the meat of today. The meat of today is actually not the text, which is funny. Um, all these things right through here <laughs> we're going to be talking about. And I'm trying to cruise through it so it's not so long. But here's what, what we want to get to. We need to, to set the ground. And this is what anchors me. A lot of this anchors me in my understanding of the text and in my belief in the inerrancy of Scripture, that there are no errors, and the transmission was preserved, and such that the message is there, and it hasn't changed, okay? Um, even Bart Ehrman, who is a New Testament critic, would admit such. We know exactly what the Bible has always said. So, firstly, let's dig it. Let me hit this, and I'm just going to delete them as I go. Y'all don't mind. Boom, the Kalam Cosmological Argument. Let's head up that Kalam. All right, Kalam, Kalam. Hey, we're still doing good. Stop recording. No, it's still doing good. Good. Thanks for hanging in there, guys. I really appreciate it, by the way. Hopefully this isn't too painful. Um, logistically. Doop. Uh, here's the Kalam Cosmological Argument, y'all. Slap that up on the screen. I don't know. Job. Oh, man. Sorry, y'all. My uh, my computer started to freak out for a second. Let's try this again. Boop. I guess it doesn't want to make it full screen, so that's okay. Um, so the Kalam cosmological argument is a wonderful argument. The president of my school, Trinity Seminary, is a huge proponent of the Kalam. I think he rightly should be. Because it's a wonderful argument. The most simplistic form of it. Oh, jeez. This thing's getting crazy today. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, I must have too much crap going on. Twenty-five minutes. Oh well. Yeah. I got a lot of stuff going on, guys. Sorry about that. Yeah. I figured that was going to happen. Photos quit on me. Sorry about that, y'all. Let's bring up our, uh, our Kalam argument again. Father God, I just pray against any spiritual forces that would be doing anything, Lord God, today. To try to distract us, to try to get our mind off of Christ Jesus, to try to get our mind off of Bible study and off of loving each other, Father. And every day here forth, I pray you would help me and help everyone listening to just be tuned in and, and engaged in Jesus' name. There it is. There's the full. There's the full picture. 
The Kalan Cosmological Argument. I'm going to get my cup of infidel here. Oh, cup of infidel. Come here. Oh, man, it's kind of cold. That's what happens when you're making a video and you're just playing around with everything for too long. It says, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Or another way, but another better way to put it would be everything that begins to exist has a cause. That's premise one. Premise two of the logical argument is the universe is one of those things, one of everything, that basically began to exist, or the physical universe. The congruous contingent reality, <laughs> um, if you will. Physical reality, universe, came to exist. So the conclusion in premise three, or uh, c conclusion, not premise, but conclusion, therefore the universe has a cause. So, what I would argue as that cause would not be random chance and mutation and, 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 and any sort of other things, but rather a mind, a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, sufficiently powerful mind. Because, and, and we'll probably unpack this a little bit more later as well, but let me hit up. Let's see if I can do this. Hey, Kalam 2.0. I was in this guy's video, so I give a shout out to uh, Religion Debate on YouTube. But he's a he's an atheist, and he kind of hones this for us, and I think it was right. It was a good idea. But the idea is right here. It says all of physical reality came to existence. That's what we mean. Okay. So. Substance dualism and stuff. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this at some point, too. There may be a refutation coming of this, by the way. I don't know if you saw that in my notes. Um, because he hones our argument here in a good way, I think. Um, and then he uses w William Lane Crane's versions of some things. And it's, it is good. It's re really well done. And it does clarify a couple points of what we mean when we're talking about the Quran as theists, right? However, um, it, it he then tries to escape the whole argument, which I'm like, no, that's stupid. And we'll get into that sometime. Uh, now that you got that, Excuse me. Whew, burp. All right, guys. So I hope it's okay, guys, that we end up talking about some origins in a study of the beginning here. We end up with quite a few things, but that's one of them is the idea that the Kalam cosmological argument gets us to a non, like I said before, immaterial, yeah, time, space, matter had to be start to exist, is what we're saying. So it can't be stuck to time, whatever caused the universe, it has to be timeless, immaterial, sufficiently powerful to create, and particularly a mind, because it has to want to create will, right? Free will. Timeless, spaceless, immaterial. Sufficiently powerful mind. So, for me, that just, just puts the argument directly where it needs to be. Sorry about the Hall of Mirrors. Let me, let me next me that, since apparently I'm talking to you. Sorry about that, guys. So yeah, that puts the argument right where it needs to be. Because now it's like, okay, no matter how far you kick the can back, to say, oh, well, something, you know, like the guy in the Kalam argument video that I was just referencing his stuff, 
effectively kicks it back and says, therefore, philosophical defeater, which is basically something that's thrown out as a philosophy. It's just thrown out as a theory of how it could be, how, how you could be wrong, or how the Kalam or whatever could be wrong. Man, that's really bright today, isn't it, guys? There we are. Sorry about that. Um, but it's thrown out as a philosophical defeater that you don't still get God, they say. They're like, well, no, you, don't st you still don't get God, necessarily. Definitely not the Christian God. It's like, well, it's not meant for that, right? All we're trying to do is establish what we're talking about. And I think the Kalam does that wonderfully. Okay, let's keep trucking. In the words of Leroy, let's keep trucking. Oh, yeah. Positive case, please. That's funny. <laughs> that still cracks me up. So the other thing is, what what are... Um, positive case, please, is the next point. Don't let an atheist just run away with... The throwing... or Basically, don't let them, let them throw all the burden of proof on you as the Christian. Because guess what? It's not your burden of proof. There is no God. That's their claim. Make them prove it. Christians are not very good at this. <laughs> or at least we haven't been the best at this. So I hope we are learning our lesson and going, you know what? No, you can't do that. That is your burden to prove. That there is no God. Go. Um, and more than that, and we're going to get into more evidence... Uh, of why I think can, reality absolutely cuts against this, okay? A positive case is that they, they're really good at sitting there on the back on the back foot defending their subjective relativism, okay? So you, you tell them, oh, well, I think X is true. I think Jesus is Lord, okay, for instance. And they go, huh, yeah, right. That Jesus guy, some weird fisher from, you know, you know back in 0 AD or whatever. Um, yeah, that's that's totally God, right? Like, more than that, like, how do you know that the Kalam doesn't even get you there, right? It's like, so those are denials. Do you hear the language? Do you hear how it's negative? What are you asserting then Jesus was? Is a good way to push back and be like, okay... Well, then you give me your positive and I'll tear it down, right? Because they're, they're good at making us make a positive case and then tearing it down <laughs> or trying. Um, and I don't think they're that great at that either because they have terrible arguments. But, but that's a stronger case for them and a stronger interaction for them. And that's why you come away feeling like, man, I don't know if I did that right or I don't know if I was able to give them the gospel is because you're not pushing that burden of proof on them. And I love to do that. Man, I like to watch atheists squirm. I really do. I love to watch them squirm. Uh, and this, these are arguments as well that, that are going to help you not only ground yourself, but push them back on, him and, or on them and make him, them squirm too. That's the whole point, one of the points of this video. So the positive case. Bam. Done. Abiogenesis is one conundrum they cannot get out of easily. Abiogenesis is oops, 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 sorry. Abiogenesis is a big problem. Abiogenesis, I don't have the definition here, but abiogenesis basically means life from non-living matter. AKA rocks don't sing. As I'm fond of saying nowadays, rocks don't sing. You can't get them to sing. Um, Aristotle, I think it was, had a funny quote too. Is uh, He said, nothing, the definition of nothing is basically that which rocks dream about. <laughs> uh, that's good. But that's what we know to be true. We know that, that non-living matter does not produce living matter. We have only seen that scientifically living matter producing other living matter. Um, 
That is, you had a mama and daddy, and your kids are going to have a mommy and daddy, and so on and on it goes. So who's the first mommy and daddy is the question. Okay. Now we're starting to get back to some holes in their ideas of what it means to have a continuous worldview. Abiogenesis is a huge conundrum for them because they not only have to get life to exist by chance in a harsh, uncaring world, pitiless, cruel world that so easily could obstruct um, any sort of semblance of life. For instance, I don't know if you guys were taught this in school, but I was. There's a test of a couple of folks, and I'll have to get the names maybe and put them in the links if I eh, if I really care to. <laughs> Let's be real. Um, <laughs> this moment, I don't seem to care to. But there's uh, an experiment that was done that basically the atheist tout is this, oh, see, life can be made, um, where a bunch of scientists, so they take a bunch of beakers and things, made this huge apparatus that's circular, and basically, they tried a whole bunch of stuff, and what they ended up with is a couple of enzymes, so not even full proteins, let alone life, right? But they got a couple enzymes, they thought, and they were like, see, there, there it is, there's life. Scientists have created life in the lab. I don't know if you were taught this in school, but I was. And, and it messed me up, by the way, so I'm not very fond of these people, and I also get rude. Well, that's why. And I need to work on that. God help me. <laughs> I don't want to get, just get rude. But, man, y'all y'all really messed me up with this. Y'all tried to make me crazy. So, this experiment, they don't, what they don't tell you is they eliminated any sort of oxygen. Because oxygen would have undoubtedly made those molecules, or the enzymes, excuse me, not viable they wouldn't have created enzymes oxygen like do you know what was swirling around on the earth when they say that this was all created water water has oxygen all in it h2o right <laughs> uh, and our atmosphere is full of oxygen and nitrogen and a lot of other things the point is is like if you if you had to eliminate oxygen in your beaker system so as to create a couple enzymes like who cares that's amazingly stupid but that's the best they got so far they're never going to make rock sing guys they're not only god can do that and even then he doesn't do that because he would have told us he did that right that's the other thing don't let them caricature your belief either so, the God of the gaps thing is out. So, oh, well, you know, just because we don't know doesn't mean that your God did it. Well, it's a better premise to say, like I said with the Kalam cosmological argument, that the timeless, spaceless, immaterial um, mind, sufficiently powerful mind and wise, was the cause of all of time, space, and matter. Yeah? This is not this is not a god of the gaps. This is a god of the clear evidence. <laughs> so alright, let's keep rolling. Boom. Boom. Irreducible complexity. The argument of irreducible complexity. So this means basically, and I'll leave this up probably for the rest of the time because this is this is where it gets heavy. Irreducible complexity means it's a, it's about evolution, um, and it's an argument that says that creation is such and so wonderfully made, wonderfully and fearfully made, mind you. Oh, that's what I didn't do. I didn't put my texts. Uh, oh. Sorry, guys. I didn't put my texts of what I wanted to encourage you last in into my notes. It's still on my phone in my text messages. Sorry, guys. But Psalm 139, verse 14. Let's pull that up really quick. 
since I'm having a fun roll right now. Huh. Oh, I didn't even show you. Okay. Now one of these days this thing will cooperate with me. There you go. Oh, 139. Work. So work. Here's some 139, 139, 100, like what was that, 139, verse 14, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, marvelous are the work, are your works, that my soul knows very well, praise God for that, God is not a stupid creator, he's not somebody who's like, oh man, I shouldn't have created like that, or, or, oh, I missed that one up. Got to scrap it and try again, right? We are fearfully and wonderfully made. The design is such in creation, this is irreducible complexity, that you cannot minimize it. You cannot have intermediate steps. Intermediate steps, which Darwinism would need, right, are impossible. They're impossible because of, well, actually, let's leave this up. Boop. Let's talk about this. So cows have four stomachs. Did you know that? they? It's kind of gross, forgive the analogy, but they chew the cud, which basically means when they chew it the first time, they swallow it, it goes to one of their stomachs. They kind of later, they kind of vomit it back up. It's kind of gross, I know. But they chew it again to get more nutrients out of it, and then they swallow it again, and it goes to a different stomach, I believe. And this happens a couple of times. Because some big animal like that that needs the nutrients out of what it's eating needs to really just absolutely grab all the nutrients out of what it eats. Otherwise, it's going to have to eat like two truckloads of grass a day. Like it can't, <laughs> it can't get the nutrients it needs unless it has this. Like at what point did they have two stomachs? At what point did they have one stomach where they did have to eat a truckload a day, right? Irreducible complexity says it can't have happened. Another example in the animal kingdom, giraffes have four hearts because their head would explode if they didn't have the circulatory ability to process all the blood. That When they lower their head, their blood pressure would spike and blow their head off if they didn't have four hearts. So basically, anatomically speaking, evolution... And we'll just keep reading because this is kind of where I trailed off on my thoughts. Evolution would have to be prophetic in nature and action. So, like I believe Christ is, and we'll get to this later, prophetic in why he made things the way he did. That's why we see what we see today because he's not stupid. He knew the lions would need it, right? We'll see. Um, but the evolution would have to be just as prophetic is what I'm saying. And that's not how evolution is touted, or, or it's not an ability of natural selection to be like, oh, you know, three years from now, you really could use this, right? <laughs> so, said another way, how long could giraffes not reach the, t the trees they feed from before they all die off or out? And how does contiguous reality, as we know it, account for the addition of the addition of vertebra, hearts, and lengthening of the already present fully formed spinal column. This amounts to a exercise in futil and mind over matter, the likes of which science disproves all the time. Just because I believe I want to be a pink elephant, I'm never going to be one. Okay. Sorry, guys, but I'm going to also hit a nerve here with some of you, and I love you to death. But just because I want to be a woman doesn't mean I'll ever be a woman. No matter how many surgeries or hormones or whatever, that is delusion. It's gender dysphoria, right? To believe I'm in the wrong body. That needs to be said in this day and age too. By the way, science disproves it, right? Science says, well, just because you get a sex change doesn't mean... You're now a woman. 
You'll never have a period. You'll never know what it's like to have cramps. You'll never know what it's like to be scared by three men stepping out of a car behind you because you're like, oh, no, it's going to, you know, now it's me. <laughs> it's my turn to get hurt or, you know, they're going to kidnap me or whatever. Your mind doesn't work. Sorry about that, guys. My phone went off. You, your mind doesn't work like a female mind, guys. Um, not to say there's a male and female brain necessarily, but I'm just saying your fears are not her fears. Her fears are not your fears. You don't understand, and I say I say guys because most of the transgenders are guys, although not all of them. Um, most transgender people, I believe, seem to be transitioning male to female, which is not a thing. You don't transition. You just hack yourself up, unfortunately, and have to deal with gross and painful realities for the rest of your life. And no wonder the suicide rate is, is out, outrageous. Uh, I love you enough to tell you, look, that's not the way to go. Get this, your mind, to agree with your heart. Or, or your body. Don't try to form your body to what your mind believes. That's not how you treat anorexia. That's not how you treat any mental issue. And yes, it's a mental issue. Gender dysphoria has always been a mental issue, no matter what the APA tries to change it to mean. So, science disproves that. You know, no matter how much, or here's another one, like Hinduism, right? No matter how much I oogity boogity and wish that, um, there's a monkey in the room, um, there's a monkey in the room, there's no, it's not going to happen, right? I don't have the power to do that, right? So here you go. No matter how badly you want to be a fish, you'll never become one. There you go. That's another. I forgot to put example in there already. Sorry, guys. If you're not, the giraffe doesn't will itself a longer neck. Laughably, that would be on par with creation next in the helo. <laughs> Meaning he'd have to. <laughs> you'll see. Um, you or it, in either case would have to become like God, a.k.a. omnipotent enough to change your own body's structure, or omniscient enough to not mess it up, by the way, which is another issue you have with transgenderism, is you end up with basically bad things going on because you've messed up your design over the design of your own body. So you have to be omniscient enough over the design of your own body just to pull off evolution. So, I welcome, welcome. <laughs> To the giraffe god, arguably the new, arguably a new one. <laughs> There's been a lot of idols over the years, but arguably that's uh, that's a new one. I haven't seen a a giraffe god who's willed himself into having new hearts and everything else. But apparently evolutionists believe that, so there you go. Which naturally, so irreducible complexity here, boom, flows into another one called intelligent design. They're akin, but they're not the same. Basically, the positive side of the coin is intelligent design, whereas the negative side of the coin is IC, or irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity says that you cannot have a half draft, okay? That's a negative, okay? Ir uh, intelligent design is a positive argument, meaning that there is intelligence in the design of things. Okay, so it's the positive side of the same coin. I'm not going to go into that. You can go look it up. Stephen Myers, Mayer, Meyer, M E Y E R, is a wonderful advocate of, of uh, intelligent design. He's an old Earth creationist, so we would differ on that. It's fine. He's still a brother. Like that's another thing. Don't make this a salvation issue. Uh, I would much rather somebody get saved and believe in evolution than not get saved. Because of evolution. Um, I think scripturally there's problems with it. And I'd be intellectually and honest if I was going to say that I don't think it matters. But I'm not going to do that either. I'm also not going to say that it matters more than Jesus Christ as Lord in your life. Okay? That's what matters more than anything. Matter of fact, if you're wrong about that, it doesn't matter what you're right about. Okay? If you're wrong with Jesus in relationship and in understanding... It doesn't matter what you're right about. You're going to hell. Sorry. So attestation of history 
and archaeology, and even fulfilled prophecy in history are irrefutable. We've seen it happen. This, that like Daniel. Did you know that the prophet Daniel wrote a book? I think it was like 200 years before Alexander the Great tromped into Jerusalem. Excuse me. And Alexander the Great comes tromping into Jerusalem. And they open up, was it Daniel chapter 7 or 8? And they say, here you go, buddy. Here you are. Our God prophesied you. We were waiting for you. He was so impressed by that, he let the city live. He let them be a vassal. He, he wiped out so many other people. But he was like, you know what? That's pretty crazy that your God was like, yeah. Uh, not only that, but that your God has said that he's going to help me to do this. And he's going to create a world kingdom. I think that's uh, Daniel chapter 7. You see uh, the kingdoms, the, the world empires that are coming, right? One of them was Greece, Alexander the Great. Why we have a New Testament that is in Greek. Um, so, like I said, fulfilled prophecy, boy, positive case, please. How did these people pull it off that we know they pulled it off before it was ever... Alexander the Great wouldn't have, if it was written after Alexander the Great, he would have killed everybody or at least some people and left only what was, you know, miserable and whatever in Jerusalem. He would have acted completely different in history. So that's irrefutable proof that the Bible is real and true and is what it says it is, which is the word of God, or at least the prophets spoke on behalf of God, all of them. And this is written by prophets, mind you, and apostles. Which were also prophetic. Here you go. Here's another good one. So we know a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot in history about Jesus. And Jesus mythicists, right here, whoop, Jesus mythicists have a burden of proof and, and an issue, we'll say, akin to swimming up against the Amazon River with all of its treachery and power in monsoon season. <laughs> Yay, historically, it is the definition of an exercise in sheer futility to say that Jesus didn't exist. It's absurd to say Jesus didn't exist. You can't do history, by the way. Let me, uh, this is a rabbit trail, but uh, let me hit this up. See how big that river is? Go ahead. Go try to swim against it. Not going to work very well, is it? Can't even see anything in it either, by the way. It's so freaking muddy. Sorry about the language. But watch. Not only that. Look at that. You're going to feel dizzy by the time you get up that river. That's, that's the Amazon, y'all. See that little boat? See this little boat right over here? <laughs> That is a huge river. And that substantiates my point. By the way, you know what lives in that river? If you're queasy or if you are uh, afraid, you may want to look away for a sec, but here you go. Stuff like that. That's called a vampire fish, I think. Look at those fangs. And that's not the, not the meanest thing either. Right? It's really not. Turn that off again. So, <laughs> yeah, go try to swim that. That's what you have the equivalent of in history if you believe Jesus didn't exist. That is literally the most attested historical fact that we have. Because of the Bible and how many copies we have, there's no greater evidence in history. So said Alexander the Great, he had, I believe, four documents. Four, I think. Nobody would ever decide to be like, oh, well, Alexander the Great didn't exist, and, and then he was all, it was all made up and contrived and just to get power over people and blah, blah, blah. All the stuff that they try to do the Bible, nobody would ever do that to them. Or the Iliad. The Iliad, right? Like Homer's Iliad also has very little attestation, and yet it has better attestation than most things in history. And the Bible blows them all out of the water. There's some 30,000 copies or something crazy. Um, just because there's more of them doesn't make it right. That's not what I'm saying. 
what I am saying is because there's more of them, we can know, excuse me, if there's been wholesale corruption, if there's been tampering with the texts, if there's been three, four different um, different uh, Christianities, if there's been like three or four different Christianities, like, like the Muslims claim that Paul was different than Peter and all the Jewish people at first were Christians, and now and then they turned a little more paganistic and multi. Uh, or um, uh, why can't I think polytheistic? Excuse me, that's the word that the Quran uses a lot. Polytheists um, say not three, right? Is what is in the surah. What is that? Oh. Nah, I'll have to figure that for you. Or maybe I'll put that in the description. But anyway, say not three, right? Like it's in the Quran. If you want to do a search, say Quran, say not three. Matter of fact, let me just do <laughs> I can do that because I'm here. Um, here we go. Duck, duck, go time. Knock, knock, time to rock. Um, say not three. See? Surah 4, 171. I didn't know we were going to go do some Islam today, but, you know, there we go. Oh, oh, oh. All right, where are we at? Stay in the spirit. Allah. Allahi. Where's he at? Yeah, here we are. So don't commit. Dalu. That's what we believe we do, Christians, is we commit excess. We say more than we should say about Jesus in your religion uh, and not say about Allah except the truth. Only Al-Masihu al Masihu. Isa. Isa. Right. Ibn. Ibn Miriam. Maryama. Rasulu Allahi. Rasul Allahi. Wa kalimatuhu. Wa kalimatuhu. Uh oh, wa kalimatuhu. Wa kalimatuhu. And his word? Wow. So he's a messenger of Allah. And his word? He's he's all his word? That's interesting. He which he conveyed to Miriam. Which he gave to Miriam. Same difference. Let's see. Na, 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 na. Do not Wala Wala Takulu say Takulu. Thalathatun. Thalathatun. Three. Intahu. Intahu. Indehu. Intahu. Indehu. Desist. Just don't say three. Oh, shoot. That wasn't even up. <laughs> anyway, you guys got it. It was four, sir, four. Dog on it. 4171. You heard it at least, right? Sorry about the rabbit trail there. But Jesus mysticists, including Muslims, have a huge burden of proof even in his crucifixion. It is one of the most historically accurate and known facts that Jesus Christ was in this in the time that we say he was, and he was died under Pontius Pilate, crucified. And Allah started Christianity, if you want to go that route. Because it says, <laughs> okay, fine, let's substantiate this and run the run the course so my mind can shut up about it. Okay, guys, thank you for your patience. I really appreciate it. Let me see, that's four. Surah 4, 175, I believe it is. Let's check it out. Mm -hmm. 
So this is akin to where we were too, by the way. Hello. Where are we at? 463, 73, 75. All right. By the way, here it is, Sura 4171. This was what I was talking about. I was going through these. You know, say three, don't say three, desist. Don't is here. Don't say three, desist. Right? So that's right here. Don't say three, desist. It's better for you, indeed, right? Because he was, he was a Razul, a messenger of, of Allah. Razul Allah. And his word, right here. Wa kalimatuhu. Oh, wa kalimatuhu. Let me just make sure I'm, I'm sharing it now. Let's see. Hey, gosh darn it. If I was any sillier. Here we go. <laughs> right here. <laughs> right. So, Wakilimaduhu, we have his word. So, Razul. Rasulu. Lu, because you have to conjugate it. Allahi. Anyway, right here. Messenger of Allah and his word. Jesus, Isa, which is actually not right, Yeshua. Yeshua is the Arabic way to say Jesus. Isa is just something that Muhammad decided to make up because he's stupid. Um. <laughs> okay, five. So the crucified him not. Let's try that. Crucified him not. Four one fifty seven. I guess I was kind of close. I thought I said that. I thought I put that in, but I guess not. As for their saying. وقولهم إنا قتلنا المسيح عيسى بن مريم رسول الله. Which, by the way, why would the Jews say they killed the Messiah? The Jews don't believe he's the Messiah. No, no, we're quite certain. That's actually one of the most certain facts in history, is that Jesus Christ died by crucifixion on the cross of Pilate. <laughs> you can't do that, Muslims. I'm sorry. I love you to death. You can't get out of this. We are not in doubt. We don't, we don't have a single doubt that Jesus was crucified and raised three days later. We love you and we want you saved. So, thank you for letting me trace that rabbit trail, that trail down. And this is what it's akin to, guys. Harakiri! Right? You ever, see, you ever heard of Harakiri? It's a chance if you lost a duel as a samurai that you would be given the chance to kill yourself, basically. Excuse me. To retain dignity. Basically, that is what these claims that people are claiming, other religions and atheists, it's, it's akin to Harakiri. It's basically a chance to just drive yourself through. Um, whoop, there you go. That's what I had up. Is it now sharing it? Yeah, okay. Sorry, guys. I had a little picture here of a guy that's been invited to Harakiri himself, um, which is Japanese, by the way, for... For those who don't know. Point being though. That's what it is to claim that Jesus didn't exist. To claim that Jesus wasn't crucified. Didn't die and then raised three days later. Like that's. Wholeheartedly what Bart Ehrman would say. He believed. People believed about Jesus. Now, I didn't say he believed it. I said he believes that people believed. 
that about Jesus. And when pushed to give a positive case, he can't handle it. He doesn't know what to say to a lot of this. So anyway, guys, let me make sure I didn't go too long as well. Uh, what are we at anyway? Ooh, hour six. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. At least it'll be less than that when I cut it out, cut out some stuff. So there's literally no thing and no one better historically attested than Jesus Christ. To say there was no Jesus is basically the most futile thing I've ever heard in my life. Historically speaking. So from historicity, you're not left with that argument. The moral argument, this is, we're almost done guys, hang in there, I'm so thankful for you guys. Thank you, thank you. Please go back and watch it again, once or twice, because you may not get all these the first time, right? The moral argument, here we go. This is one of my favorites. This is the one that pushed me as an atheist to to live out a, or at least to feel, realize how I could not live out my belief system. Because if I did, it would be very bad. And this is why I can't go back either. Because I will, I am just crazy enough to live consistently within the systematic that, that I would be dealt, morally speaking, as an atheist. So morally, the subject of relevance the more the subjective relativist, excuse me, cling desperately to their morality, you've heard this a lot lately, or their truth, right? The more the truth, the actual truth, or objective morality clobbers them. When they try, specifically when they try to dissuade others from quote unquote wrong. Just, just think about that for a little bit. Am I still sharing my screen? Dang it, I'm not. Whoop. Hey! I'm getting better at this. Oh, that's the wrong screen anyway. That's the right screen. There you go. Think about that for a little while. The more that subjective relativists cling desperately to their morality or their truth, the more the truth, and the, aka objective morality, clobbers them when they try to dissuade others from wrong. Okay. Example. You believe... No, I'll make me the, the one with the dull heart, okay? I believe abortion's okay, which I don't. Don't tell me that. I don't, don't yell at me for that. I don't believe abortion's okay, okay? I believe it's a life, and I believe life has to be justly taken, and there's only certain parameters you can even do that with. Least of all, a, a baby fresh in the womb. Now, now that I preface that, say I don't believe that. Say I believe that abortion's okay at least in the cases of incest and rape, right? We'll go there and make the argument harder to refute or less of a caricature. So I tried to dissuade you from, from curtailing my choice then, right? Or if I was a woman, well, say my woman's choice. My woman. <laughs> my wife's choice. Um, that she wants to, or whoever I'm dating wants to, uh, have an abortion, and I don't see any problem with it. Okay. Um, it'd be like me trying to come to you then and saying, "Well, I'm not an abo I don't believe abortion's bad, so therefore you shouldn't either." And I'd look at you sideways because it's like, wait, you just said everybody's truth is their truth, except for mine. So everybody has the right to their own truth, except for the one that I disagree with. You see how that doesn't work? So even relativists of, oh, geez, I keep doing that. Relativists don't get that pass. They don't get that card, right? They don't get to pass that card. Because even subjective relativists have a exclusion in their actual worldview. Just like the law of non-contradiction, as Ravi usually says. The more you try to clobber it, the more it clobbers you. Okay. Argument from higher intelligence, and we're pretty much done after this, guys. In reason, a.k.a. survivally, which is probably not a word, <laughs> non-essentials. 
Non-essentials for survival is how that should be worded. Non-essentials for survival. Such as what? Well, self-sacrificial -sac self love and free will. Let me move that down a little bit. Self-sacrificial love and free will. Those don't fit in the system. Oh, I guess I can leave that up because I don't need to see me. You guys need to see me. Ooh, that's the wrong one. I'm really good at this, aren't I? Sorry, guys. So, yeah, you can still see me. <laughs> I forget you guys can still see me. Because I can't see me. All right, so self-sacrificial love and free will. Courage and bravery in the face of adversity at the expense of one's own self-preservational instincts, i.e., or versus the animal world's seeming insufficiency or inability, such as lions choosing lettuce or going to court. They don't do that, right? And many times inevitable reversion into save myself mode to avoid pain and suffering and death. Even we see this in the situation, if the situation is as dire as the death, their death or their children's death, which cuts against the evolutionary's claims of passing on genetics. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. All I'm saying here is all of this cuts against passing on one's genetics. Courage, free will, bravery, sacrificial love cuts against I just need to pass on my genetics, which is apparently the, the whole thing in life to evolutionists or to people who believe that propagating DNA machines is all we are. And even that doesn't work very well because even then they're not... These things that we extol, such as love, free will, bravery, courage, honestly are, are actually weaknesses in some ways. Um, because love gets you killed sometimes, right? So here we go. Let's keep going. I already read that. So higher creatures such as ourselves, humans, seem and maybe even angels, seem to have an uncanny resolve and amazing ability to lay down our lives. To lay down our lives as we will, or as we want to. And for whom, when, we will, or want to. Thanks to higher reason, that seems unshared by the rest of the creatures, of lower creatures, such as rabbits and dogs and whatnot. And even then they have, they typically have less resolve. Well, they, they do have the ability to show self-sacrificial love. So this is my other thing. I'm not saying that, that animals are incapable of loving their humans or dying for their humans. I'm saying they're not willingly laying down their life in the same way that we would reason and do so. The reason bit is what I'm denying they have. They don't have languages. They don't have a lot of things, okay? Let's keep going. Presumably they have some sort of communication that doesn't parallel ours. Others, un others unparalleled in the animal world include justice, a.k.a. courts of law. You don't take a, a lion to court just for killing a gazelle, do you? It don't make sense. Okay, that's what I was kind of getting at before. Language, imagination, creativity, literature, art, music, art, math, all those cut against ev the evolutionary narrative, if you ask me, of cosmic star dirt to you, well, from Cosmic Starter to you by way of goo in the zoo. <laughs> Primordial soup being goo, right? And the zoo being animals to us. The, all that does not work in my, in my estimation. Excuse me. Um, so anyway, guys, I know I went too long already. Even with cutting out that little portion, it's going to be at least an hour already 16 minutes into the hour so i'm so thankful you guys sat through that i hope it blessed you there's a lot there there's a lot there and i encourage you to go back and, and listen again i don't think i rabbit trailed too long too much there's one in islam but you know that that shows comparative religion religion other religions too 
not just atheism. There's tons of claims made by other religions that are unsubstantiated and unsustain unsustainable. So anyway, guys, thank you so much. I love you all. Please like, comment, subscribe. Um, hit the notification bell. Turn it on to all so you get all my videos. Send them everywhere you can, please. Please support me on Patreon, guys. Um, I already have some support on Patreon, but I need more. As I said before, right, if I'm going to continue doing this, and if I'm to do this better and with more quality stuff like a camera, a mic, I already have a mic, but I'm working on that. But I need a new camera. I would I would like a webcam uh, so you guys could see me. It wouldn't be all fuzzy like it is. Um, also, I just, uh, I believe God has this for me as going forward as his, his plan to some degree um, for the rest of my life. Make any sense? Um, and I, I want to get started on it. I don't want to wait any longer. By his grace, I won't have to wait any longer. Anyway, guys, um, we may do less music. It's another thing. Uh, just little tidbits are fine, it seems, but we'll probably do less music as well because I don't, well, again, I don't fancy getting demonetized by promoting music, especially when those people in the music should probably be reaching out to me and being like, hey, I want free marketing, right? So, Brooke Reeves, uh, Leroy Hemp, uh, Hemp, excuse me, um, you guys, perfect opportunity to get some airtime. Uh, if I could use your content, right, if I could use some of your songs or whatever as intros and outros, Hit me up. Um, if you want to send this to them, please do. Oh, Jeremy. <laughs> anyway, I love you guys. I'll, I'll uh, talk to you later, okay? Peace.